Really delighted to have Rosario with us this afternoon to discuss how defence establishments are using, recognising artificial intelligence as a really pivotal asset in securing strategic advantage. We see it that you know, the race to harness AI for defence purposes is, is really accelerating globally. And its integration, you know, it's spanning from uh, logistical frameworks uh, all the way through to combat operations. The widespread adoption of AI into defence prompts both operational and ethical and conceptual changes. And, you know, in many cases, there are some really significant ethical questions and risks to be considered, and Rosaria is the person who best does this. Her formal title is Professor of Digital Ethics and Defence Technologies. Uh, as far as I know, she is the only holder of that title in any university worldwide. Uh, I think she's probably also the only um, female professor, I think, of defence technologies, certainly within Europe, I don't know about the US, but I'm very proud of that. She's also programme director of our DPhil programme in information, communication and social sciences, so she spends a lot of her time supporting our outstanding DPhil students. She's also uh, the ethics fellow at the Alan Turing Institute's Defence Science and Technology Lab. Last but not least, she is a member of the ethics advisory panel of the MOD. So you can see she's hugely, hugely well informed on these topics. Her recent work has focused largely on the ethics and governance of digital technologies, and it ranges from designing governance measures to leverage artificial intelligence, uh, to addressing the ethical challenges of using technologies in, in defense, thinking about the ethics of cyber security more generally, and how you govern in cyber conflict situations. Just a couple of pieces of housekeeping before we begin. Um, the first, for your awareness, that we are recording this event. I guess uh, in the defence context, it's always best to assume you're being recorded, but we definitely are in this case. Uh, and we will be posting this talk online on our website afterwards. The presentation we're planning to last for about 40 minutes, and we will have scope for questions after that. Um, just if you can save your questions until we finish, and Rosario will answer them when we get there. And also just to be aware, those questions will be included in the recording. Um, and then last but not least, um, I hope you'll stay with us after we've finished uh, that academic conversation. We're going to invite you all to join us upstairs for some drinks, uh, which will be in the library and the Lord Cochrane room on the next floor. So it's really lovely to have you all here. And with that, I'm going to hand over to my fantastic colleague, Rosaria. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for being here uh, today. Thank you to Rusin for hosting us and to the events team at the OAI for uh, organizing this lecture. And Vicky, thank you for the introduction. There was one thing that Vicky didn't mention because she is very clever, so she tries to uh, hide all the possible uh, darkest corner. I'm a philosopher, so you're in for one hour of philosophy before drinks. The drinks are the perk. You need to stay here for one hour. We don't give drinks to people who leave before. So uh, keep that in mind when uh, in the most boring part of this, uh, of this lecture. So when we started organizing this lecture a few months ago, um, I thought that, well, that's a fantastic opportunity. I just submitted a book, uh, which very title, whose very title is The Ethics of AI in Defense. I thought, well, that's a fantastic opportunity. I can tell people about the key finding of this book, uh, which is all about the ethics of AI in defense, and then uh, complex but consistent uh, ethical framework to address the changes of AI uh, in defense and the challenges that that follows. Then I've been presenting these ideas uh, across the UK, Europe, and I realized that there is a preliminary question to the ethics of AI in defense that I need to address. So I'm gonna take this opportunity here today to change a little bit uh, the topic of the lecture to, to, to see whether the uh, answer to this preliminary question uh, works. You let me know during the Q&A. What we're going to do today is to talk about AI and defense, particularly digital warfare, and then ask three questions about ethics. Why do we, do we need an ethics of AI in defense? What does an ethics of AI in defense look like? And how do we apply an ethics of AI in the defense domain? Uh, and by then, uh, hopefully within 40 minutes, I will be ready to leave you with a message. To start with, 
When we talk about AI these days, there is a lot of hype. Uh, we come uh, from months and months of distraction about uh, AI becoming super intelligence, uh, singularity alignment problem, it can write better than us, so it's gonna be intelligent as we are, it, it can write songs as we do, so it's creative as we are. And when you add that to the fence, then you open up a whole new kind of worms because of course, autonomous weapon systems are going to become aware and develop intentions to kill us all. Yes, if you're reading science fiction, not if you're doing research, particularly not if you're doing research at the OAI. So I wanted to clear the ground from false starters and false premises. They are very bad habit in philosophy, because if you start with a false premise, any deductive reasoning will be voided, because anything follows from a false premise. So we don't do sci-fi today. You will not hear me talk, uh, telling you stories about uh, machines becoming aware, super intelligence, online issues, none of that. What we're going to do is to refer to a set of technologies which we call AI these days. Uh, perhaps artificial intelligence is the only catchphrase, catchy phrase that academics ever managed to come up to acquire funding. Uh, AI describes a category of technologies. Those who are more close to my age might remember the symbolic AI or the sub-symbolic AI, the evolutionary algorithms. Uh, from the past few years, we talked about neural networks, machine learnings, LLMs in the past few months. We don't have to go into the nuts and bolts of, it, of specific details for the purposes of this talk. But for the next, uh, next 40 minutes, when I refer to AI, I refer to, the, I refer to this thing a growing resource of interactive, autonomous, and self-learning agency, which can be used to perform tasks that would otherwise require human intelligence to be executed successfully. There are two parts to this definition. The second one is the one that allows us to disregard all the sci-fi. It's about a technology that works without being intelligent. If Luciano Floridi was here, he will tell you that AI works because it's a divorce between intelligence and agency, not the opposite. Then the first one is also very important. These four words here, interactive, autonomous, self-learning, and agency. I'm not talking about tools, I'm talking about agents. These are the four seeds from where the potential of AI to improve things in any domain you want apply it stem from, and also the risks that come coupled with this, with this potential. So keep in mind this definition for the next few minutes. Now, when it comes to defense and AI, over the past 12 years, since the US published the Directive on Autonomy in Defense, the focus has been on autonomous weapon systems. But these days, we know better than that. Autonomous weapon systems are one way in which we use AI in defense. What we're learning, particularly through the war in Ukraine, is that AI can be applied across the scope of defense operations. The reason why I have this picture here is to remind us of the use of artificial intelligence for face recognition. This is a use which is very problematic in the civilian world, but we have done it, we have used it in the Ukraine war to identify uh, uh, captured, wounded, or killed Russian soldiers so that the Ukrainians could inform their family trying to breach the Russian propaganda, inland propaganda. So this is one way of using it. This talk will be about the ethical implications of current and foreseeable uses of AI across the scope of the defense uh, operations. I don't particularly like taxonomy, but at this point, if I mention a scope uh, a few times, I have to tell you where, what is the range. Uh, and it goes from uh, uses which we will say are for sustainment and support. Uh, we use AI these days in defense for back office operation, HR. Um, for logistics and operational planning. How much water do I need to send to the people on the front line? And then AI for artificial intelligence. You might familiar, be, be familiar with the expression OSINT, open source intelligence analysis. We're developing, we're acquiring huge amount of data. We use AI to analyze those data. What's the relevance in defense? Well, we're using OSINT again in Ukraine to identify valuable uh, information that helps strategic and tactical thinking. I'm gonna be mentioning the war in Ukraine a few times for the next few minutes, then I won't uh, any more in the second part of this talk, but this is for a specific purpose. And then we use AI also for what technically is defined as the adversarial and non-kinetic uses, cyber warfare. I'm gonna to refer to it as cyber warfare from now on. Uh, AI is used for system responses. How do I counter an attack? But also for offensive cyber. How do I design an attack and I 
deploy an attack, and also to design malware. And finally, kinetic. Uh, kinetic is the conventional war when we do physical damage. And of course, there are lethal autonomous weapon systems. Now, these systems are not anymore, unfortunately, sci-fi uh, systems. The first use of autonomous weapon system has been reported in 2021 in Libya. We see them used every day on the Ukrainian front, both from uh, the Ukrainians and the Russians. Now, from an observer point of view, we cannot say whether these systems were used in a fully autonomous mode or semi-autonomous mode, because you cannot know that when you look at them. But this is a technology that can be potentially used in a fully autonomous mode. It's not just that. We can use AI for tactical and strategical decision-making processes. You might remember uh, Gospel, the system used by Israel to identify target in, Ga in Gaza. And also AI is used to monitor the vitals of soldiers on the ground to understand well, how they're doing and whom to send to the next operation, given the, their well-being. The use of AI in defense across its domain is not something that happens out of the blue. It needs to be contextualized, and it needs to be contextualized in a process that concerns the transformation of the defense establishment. Now, in academia, we've been fighting for decades about whether the digital revolution is prompting a revolution of military affairs, so it only changes the operation, or is a military revolution, so it's changing the idea of power and the military establishment. I don't care about this distinction. I'm not going to uh, go there. It's only fun if you are an academic, not really once you uh, come out of the Oxford bubble. But there is another element to consider there. Digital technologies have been developed for defense purposes since day one. I don't need to mention Turing to this audience. I don't need to mention the internet as well. But it's true that then defense operation, defense establishment, let's look at this technology with a little bit of suspect later on. NATO has included cyber as a domain of warfare only in 2016. It's not so many years ago. And when we did that, we did it with this mindset. There is one side of defense operation that happens into the analog world, the physical world, where you have physical agents, physical targets, and thing, uh, things happen with some level of violence, medium to high. And then you have cyber with digital agents and targets and no force, no violence. Uh, most of the times being deployed there. The cyber is separated from the rest. It's a silos. It might help, it might not help, but it's one element which is com compartmentalized. If you look again at the war in Ukraine, and this is why I've been mentioning it quite a bit, the two things are not separated anymore. They are very much intertwined. Before the uh, invasion, there were 122 attacks against this, uh, the Ukrainian government in the two and three days preceding the, uh, the, the Russians' attack on the terrain. Cyber attacks, cyber agents, sorry, digital agents, digital, uh, digital targets, as well as physical agents and physical targets. And a use of force which goes from zero to 100, potentially. We hope not, but uh, that's the scope. So AI works in defense because defense is digitalized and war has become a digital war. It's completely dependent on digital technologies. The adoption of AI is not capillary yet, but the potential is there. So that's why I focus on AI, because it's perhaps the most compelling evidence of this process, the next step to happen. But it doesn't happen in a blue sky scenario, so to speak. It's a contest already designed for it. So when we use AI in defense, what are the ethical problems that we face, the challenges? If you look at the AI for sustainment and support, most of the topics listed here on slides, they're familiar. It's about trust, how much do we trust technology, is that a trust bi a tech bias, so we acquire uh, the output of a piece of technology in a non-critical way, uh, accountability gap, issues concerning robustness and transparency, and human rights. That's part of, of, of the picture, because when you move on to the cyber element, the warfare element, the word adversarial there is very important, because it were, it's what flags the fact that we're moving from an internal to an external interstate uh, uh, confrontation. Then you have um, challenges which refers to the risk of escalation, the moment in which you have AI running attacks, then you have little control. And if you have little control, perhaps the next attack is a little bit more intense than the previous one, and that might create an escalating dynamic. We have issues concerning the consistency with just war theory. Does the principle of self-defense work also in cyberspace or not? How do we assess proportionality in this, in this domain? And then, of course, you have 
moral responsibility gap when it comes to autonomous weapon system. This is a serious issue. We're not able to attribute in a fair and justified way the responsibility for the actions of AI systems. So how do we deal with that when an AI system is powering a weapon? <coughs> Issues concerning human dignity, but also just what you again, particularly distinction and necessity. So far, the tendency has been to consider these questions in a sort of vertical way. But that's the wrong approach. Because if you are a defense establishment, you need to address these challenges in a systemic but also consistent way. You have to make sure that your solution for the cyber warfare is consistent with the principles you are protecting for. The kinetic one cannot be otherwise. And so this is for, uh, if I've told you about the books, I would have been uh, describing in details for the next 20 minutes, but not today. Usually I use these slides to argue or address the question, why do we need an ethics of AI? We need an ethics of AI because of those challenges. We need to address those challenges. The thing I realized in the past few weeks is that people who ask why do we need a question, um, an ethics of AI are not asking a what for type of questions. They're not asking about what kind of problems we can resolve with ethics of AI. They're asking a weather question. Do we need an ethics of AI at all, especially in these circumstances? Now, this question comes from two camps. Uh, the first one is the one who consider warfare the absolute evils. And if war is the absolute evil, ethics has to do nothing with it because he might justify war, which is an evil. I don't agree with this view because I agree that war is an absolute evil. I also believe that there is a right to self-defense. And if there is a right to self-defense, there are justifiable war, wars. This does not mean that crime, atrocities, and perfidy does not happen in warfare. And that's why we need an ethics of AI in defense. The opposite camp is more akin to what perhaps you would think is political realism. And their position comes from two, from two places. The first one is, well, why do we need to bother with ethics of AI? Because when we bother with ethics of AI, we concede a double advantage to our opponent. While we waste time thinking about bonding, limiting the using of AI, the opponent doesn't, and also use it in a wide, wider way. So why are we doing this? We really don't have to do that. And my answer to that is that if we're using AI to defense, defend liberal democracies, are we really going to defeat ourselves in the very first place by breaching the very values we want to defend? We might as well give up uh, without even trying. And then the thing that upsets me the most about this position is that they start from a very wrong idea of ethics. Ethics is not about limitations. It's not the mother or the father who tells you, do not go out, don't drink, don't have fun. It's a different story. Ethics is a conceptual analysis to identify strategies for risks and opportunities. And I stress these three words, conceptual analysis, risks, and opportunities. We mention a lot the digital transformation, the disruption that comes with it. How are we going to deal with these changes if we don't understand their nature, conceptually, as a philosopher will do? And how are we going to channel or drive this, this transformation if we don't manage to mitigate the risks and leverage the opportunity? You cannot do that without ethics. And I say this because not only you know, in Italy we will say Cicero pro domo sua, it's my job to do ethics, but because we've done this in the wrong way in the past. Once we gave the wrong answer to the question whether we need ethics when it comes to cyber warfare, and things have not gone well in the past 15 years. Now, cyber warfare uh, is a very interesting phenomenon because it's indicative of many changes brought about by the digital revolution. The digital revolution is an operational revolution, it's a technological one, but it's also a conceptual one. Imagine the idea of war. We have defined war in many ways, but the definition centers around the two elements. is a coercive behavior delivered through the use of force. And since Cicero on, we have regulated the use of force to regulate war waging. Now think about a cyber attack. There is a coercive behavior, but there is no use of force anymore. How do we regulate it? If there is no use of force, it's like international humanitarian law, just war theory, they have nothing to uh, grasp on. And it's not just that. Cyber warfare changes some aspects 
within the fence in a quite radical way. Now, this is a fortress, as you can see. It's not true in all cases, but in kinetic conflicts, security and defense go in hand in hand. This is the task of a fortress. It keeps secure the people inside and defends them from attacks coming from the outside. The two things are together. In cyber, the two things are going in different directions. Cybersecurity is more and more about engineering a system, verification and validation, debugging. Cyber defense is very much about fencing off a system, an attack, countering, responding, preventing. This is another change which we have to keep in mind that you don't realize it if you don't think about it conceptually, philosophically. Why is this important? I'm going to go back to the weather answer, but bear with me five minutes. It's a bit of a long reasoning, but uh, it has its uh, points at the end. In cyberspace, launching a non-kinetic attack. So a non-kinetic attack is an attack which does not cause any physical damage to things or uh, humans. These are easier to launch than kinetic attacks. They cost much less. Attribution is less problematic than it used to be, but it's quite feasible these days. And you're quite likely to be successful. Once you attack a system, sooner or later you will get there. Defense in cyberspace is not futile, but it's porous. Attacks will go through. And this makes cyberspace a domain of persistent offense. So it's when defense and offense are constantly in contact, because defense is constantly poked by attacker. And this is why, when we think about cyberspace, we have the so-called security dilemma, or the weaponization of this space. Everybody acquires capability to offend, not to secure themselves, because defense is not such a successful attitude or strategy anyway. This creates quite a vicious circle. This is the reason why we hear about cyber attacks every day. There was the Munich Security Conference a few weeks ago. Uh, the security index that they released shows that in the G7 countries, cyber attacks are the second most severe threat perceived. In the BRICS country, the fourth. But this is why. Because there is a strategic nature of cyberspace that leads to that. Interesting, interestingly, state actors play a central role into this context. Because if you have to defend, well, you have to defend it according to these strategies. So what have we done? Well, we have developed proactive defense strategies. The UK started with the active cyber defense, but now we have a national cyber force which does offensive cyber. I don't need to mention Russians. Uh, the US has uh, the so-called defense forward approach. Israel has been developing and testing skills for decades. Since 2018, NATO uh, can rely on the offensive capability of its member state to respond <coughs> to cyber attacks. So we We've done quite a bit of uh, work as state actors in this, in, this, in this domain. And then the last bit, AI. AI will make this circle, or it's going to make this circle spin much faster. Why? Well, because I say, as I said before, we use it uh, to run attacks. But that's not the real reason. It's because this is a very fragile technology. We are delegating to AI tasks in cyber without being so mindful of the fact that its robustness is very, very low. So robustness in technical terms uh, is a characteristic of uh, computational systems. And you will define it as the ability of the system to keep working as it is expected for the system to do, even when they are under attack. Experts will tell you that robustness of AI is a computationally intractable problem, because AI is so sensitive to so many variables that you cannot really tell, tell which one will break it. It was a famous example when an image recognition system started to confuse turtles for rifles just because one pixel in the image was changed. That's the level we're talking about. And we have a whole new set of uh, attacks. Uh, Andreas is here, so I will be careful about prompt injection. He is the master of it. But uh, uh, all these attacks have something in common. They've gone from working to extract data or disrupt the system to acquire control to, of the system, to make this to the system something that the legitimate user wouldn't. So it's a huge Trojan horse that we're throwing to this picture. This situation creates what I call the stability dilemma. Now, stability dilemma is a situation where, in order to maintain stability, you have to have adversarial strategies, which might escalate. 
What is the relevance here with the AI ethics? Why do we need ethics? Because the strategic dilemma emerges because of the nature of cyberspace, but is exacerbated by the normative gap in which all this happens. We don't have regulation for any of the non-kinetic operations the state run. And we don't have any regulations because about 15 years ago, the answer to the weather question was no, we don't need an ethics of AI or an ethics of cyber warfare. What we did at the time was to force cyber into the shape of kinetic. We thought about cyber in, in, cyber in terms of kinetic to dodge precisely, I would say the ethics bullet, someone else would say the normative bullet. What did we say was, well, we have international humanitarian laws. We have just war theory. All we have to do is to interpret those so that they will consider cyber as well. This is the rationale behind the great failure of the Tali manual. How that story ends? Whatever is, does not have kinetic effects, we don't regulate because it's equal to espionage or sabotage. Fast forward to 2024, we miss the strategy. We don't have regulation to understand what is a legitimate or an illegitimate target. We don't have understood how to calculate damage to non-physical things. We don't have a strategy to coordinate alliance, alliance around technical standards. More importantly, we don't have accountability. Something goes extremely wrong within the cyber domains. We don't have rules to punish people. So this is why we need an ethics of AI in defense to achieve all these goals here. So now that I hopefully have convinced you that we absolutely need an ethics of AI in defense, no question asked anymore, what does this ethics look like? Now, the uh, defense establishment came to the AI ethics debate a little bit later than other domains. Uh, the first set of principles, I'm going to show them in a moment, is from 2019. This is a conceptual map of 2020, which gives you a sense, if I stand here perhaps it's easier, of how many sets of principles you had uh, there at the time. A review published a year later counted, I can never remember, 89 or 87. Interestingly, you see that there are recurring themes in, this, uh, in these maps. All these frameworks, they mention for sure uh, transparency, uh, human rights, privacy, security, explainability, human control. I have to say that the people in defense, they, were, they did their own work. They really tried to build their principles on this, on this ones. And so the US came up in uh, 2019 with five principles about use of AI, which has to be responsible, equitable, traceable, reliable, and governable. The year later, the UK came up with uh, a similar set of principles, human centricity, responsibility, understanding, bias, uh, and our mitigation, reliability. For disclosure, I am funded by the STL, and some of my work uh, was conducive to uh, inform the policy debate behind these uh, principles. And then NATO, a bit later, um, stating principles about the use of AI, which has to be lawful, I mean, and you wonder whether that needed to be clarified because it implies that it could also be not lawful, so that made me jump on a chair when I read it. Responsible and accountable, protecting and enhancing explainability and transparency, reliability, equity, and human centricity. Look at this slide, I'm gonna show it in a moment again. There is something missing, and there's a huge, a huge absence here. Don't say it, but keep it with you. There are two limitations. The first one is the focus, and the second one is the level of these principles. Those principles, they mirror the language of the AI ethics literature. It's all about fairness, transparency, accountability, human rights, all correct, but that's not the point. We're developing principles for AI in defense. The question is not what problems AI creates in general. The question is what are the ethical challenges when we use AI for coercion? The word that is missing here is justice. And it's not a random lack or a random miss. Uh, the US principle uh, came uh, in a short version and then a long, very nice document by the Defense Innovation Board where they actually address this point. So they use the principle equitable and they avoid the use of justice on purpose. They say the principle stems from the DOD mantra uh, that fights should not be fair, as the DOD aims to create the conditions to maintain an unfair advantage over any potential adversaries 
thereby increasing the likelihood of deterring conflict from the outset. All fair. It's a given that in war, one side would have an advantage of the other. But we distinguish just from unjust behavior in warfare. There is a concept of justice in war which is different from the one that we apply to civilian contest, and it has to be front and center when we're talking about AI and defense. So the work, uh, you know, if you go back to the uh, taxonomy I showed at the beginning, just for theory is crucial. It's crucial in the context of cyber because, for example, if you think about it, you might realize that in cyber prevention might be more permissible than it is uh, in, in kinetic. You, we need to understand what is the proportionality criteria there. And the debate on autonomous weapon system, well, it has centered on dignity for decades, and you know, th this is important. But what if we start thinking about these weapons in terms of their ability to comply with the principles of mm, distinction and necessity? But as that will take us out of the impasse where we are and will give us boundaries to understand what is permissible and not, acceptable boundaries for our societies. So the work I've been developing in, uh, in, uh, in my research, and hopefully one day you'll be able to see in the book, is uh, the idea to have an ethics of AI in defense with, which addresses the ethical challenges of AI for coercion. Not just AI, not just coercion, the two things. Uh, in a consistent way with just war theory. Now, this work is done in two ways. When it comes to cyber, it's very much of a philosophical work. Just war theory remains a valid theory because the principles are still the one that we desire. We want attacks in response to be proportionate. We want non-combatants not to be involved in the contest of war. But it's a theory that assumes what in philosophy we'll say is a very specific ontology. It's an analog ontology. It's an ontology, a world made of tangible objects of things and humans. We need to find a way to extend this ontology so to include also virtual things, which are, which are as real as the physical one, just have a different nature. And that requires also a theory of value, which translated is basically we need to understand what's good and bad in this domain. And then when it comes to autonomous weapon system, the work has to be done in terms of risk assessment, understanding to what extent this machine, autonomous weapon systems can respect the principles of just for theory, what the risks are, and what are the risks that we as society are willing to take. And then the level. There's been a criticism that those principles I showed before, they are of too high a level to offer any real guidance. Now, this is a criticism I don't share because um, Jess is here and she's written about this extensively, so I'm gonna say something wrong, but she's kind of will not correct me. These principles are very much like constitutional principles. They are not meant to give you specific guidelines. They are foundational. They are more like a compass, not like a map. They give you a direction. What we need to do is to draw the map. Now be careful, because drawing a map is a normative act. Now, I'm sure you recognize this. This is the Gary Mander. It's a map published in 1812, uh, which redesigned the Massachusetts uh, electoral district to advantage the uh, Republican Democratic coalition of the time for the Senate election. It changes the way votes were considered. It's a metaphor. So what we're doing these days is to drawing a map. We have a lot of work being done to translate the principles into practices, tools. There is plenty of uh, tools, standards, guidelines being developed. But we should be careful because the tools themselves, they have normative implications. If you decide to use some audit processes for your AI systems, you might want to choose between systems which refer to uh, qualitative or quantitative metrics. Depending on the choice, you're going to audit different parts of your system. So it's a choice that has normative implication. Because we're talking about a high-risk domain, ethics also needs to concern different interest, which are all legitimate, but sometimes contrasting. So using a tool also implying balancing off different interests. What we're missing here is that between the principles and the tools, there is an interpretation which is ethically loaded. Insofar as we forget this step, we run two risks. We're almost there, I promise. Five more minutes and then there will be drinks. Uh, I call it the ethics devolution. It's where an organization gives itself voluntary ethical principles, and then it devolves the responsibility 
to extract guidelines from these principles to members of its staff, who might lack the expertise, will not have the ability to consider all the involved interests, and will take a responsibility to do something which should be really independent. The second risk is ethics lobbying. The tools, the guidelines, the standards might become or be perceived as regulation when they are not, because they have not been mandated through a legislative process. So they might be used to push away the need to regulate AI in defense. Mind that in Europe, which is the most advanced place for AI regulation, the AI Act specify at the very beginning that they don't deal with AI in defense. So at the moment, we don't have any regulation for the use of AI in defense. What do we need then? Well, we need a methodology to do this translation. I won't bore you with the methodology, the specifics, but I mentioned before, uh, AI principles are like constitutional principles. Constitutional courts, they have methodologies to apply those principles to specific cases. We might want to learn them less. A methodology has to do three things. It has to be able to, or it has to be, sorry, applied by an independent, expertise-led, and multi-stakeholder group, which has to work with one aim, achieving moral impartiality, as Habermas will say. This is when a group of people which represent different interests is able to arrive at a conclusion which is considered fair by all the involved parties. True reasoning. A bit idealistic, but let's set ourselves higher standard. Um, the interpretation has to be reproducible and scrutable, because that's the only way in which we can improve it. We shouldn't think that it's something we start uh, doing in the best possible way from the beginning. And then we need accountability. For example, principles are going to be balanced once against the other. So we want to know what is the criteria to which this is done. Uh, constitutional courts call it the conditional presence relation when judges state to which principle they give, get, they give preeminence. So this is work to be done uh, 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 ahead of, uh, of next, after, the, after this lecture perhaps. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that it was clear that the translation we see these days about ethics of AI in many contexts is not perhaps the one that we desire as society. And now uh, to the message. The idea about this message uh, uh, has been with me for many, many years when I first read the On War, uh, Clausewitz's book. There is one sentence where he says, we say therefore, war belongs not to the province of arts and science, but to the province of social lives. Now, Clausewitz was a very smart person, I don't have to state that, uh, and the book is lovely, not the least because it expresses a lot of Kantian views, but also because he frames war in the context of international relations. So when he mentions social life, he's really mentioning this kind of international mm, uh, back and forth. But he made me think about another, another element, which is my message. There is a relation of mutual influence between society and war. We wage war through the technology that we develop, and we wage war following the values of our societies. But war is a test bed for the seriousness of those values. How far are we willing to stretch those values when we are in war is indicative of how much we are there to defend those values, we take those values for real. And this is also true for digital societies. There is a, just another caveat here. Digital societies are transitional societies. We're not here to stay. We are witnessing this disruption about digital technologies. But at some point, digital tech will go from front and center stage to the background. There will be a key infrastructure for future societies, but we will not be going to lectures like this one. Hopefully, we will have moved on. The shape we give to digital, digital technologies today will inform what I call the post-digital societies. And so the ethics of war and the ethics of AI in war is a key element if you want to make sure that post-digital societies will continue to be or will be a better version of liberal democracies, pluralistic place, just and tolerant societies. And with this I have to thank you and thank the OAI for the funding in kind. You have no idea how beautiful it is to work in this place with so much talent for 10 years. Oxford for some funding. NATO, CCD, COE, the STL, and the Alan Turing for funding as well. Thank you so much.
Rosaria, thank you so much for that, for that talk. I, I think there's a sort of particular, it takes a particular talent as an academic to talk us through something as complex as philosophy and make it sound as comprehensible and, and, and sort of vivid as you do. So thank, I, yeah, you. thank you so much for that. Um, I hope you've got some questions in the audience. I'm gonna take the chair's privilege and, and just kick off with maybe one of my own, first of all. Um, which is, how, how much of this do you think is, is relevant in a world where we no longer have a monopoly on the sort of use of coercion by states, but an increasing array of non-state actors engaging in this space, particularly in the non-kinetic space? Does the ethics of AI in defense also apply to them? So it applies in a different way, I would say. So I'm, I'm quite categorical in this sense. So I think that the ethics of war is about an ethics that involves two actors as states. Uh, when you're fighting crime or terrorism, you are at a different level. Uh, and so you have different kind of boundaries to, 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 to the actions that you can do as a state. But that does not mean that there is no regulation, and there, is no, there are no boundaries. And I think this is important to stress because uh, I will be very philosophical here, but the authority of a state, uh, is, I'm not very much in agreement with Dobbs, it's not just about the use of force, it's about the moral stance that you have as a state. So losing that, it would be a huge defeat. Uh, and so it's important that we distinguish between just war theory and uh, human rights, for example, when we fight against terrorists. But rules are different, but they're still there. Okay, thank you. So, over to you, questions. Yeah. Gentleman in the front row, and I'll take the lady behind. Second row. The ability to condense all of that into such a short and pithy presentation was Thank you. brilliant. Um, you talked about force and no force being involved in the non-kinetic cyber warfare. I was just wondering how you define force because I know, for instance, I'm in a tiny company and I know the website's attacked every single day. If somebody gets entry, they have forced entry, even though it's in the virtual world. So maybe we need to rethink what we mean by force, do you think? Correct. I mean, force is very much linked to the use of, uh, to the germane concept is violence. Uh, uh, technically speaking, force has to do with kinetic effects. So if somebody breaks into a website or you know, is able to jam your machines and to, to, to make you know, the fun goes high and that sort of things, that would be force. But as long as that kinetic damage does not happen, that's not force. And I think it's an important distinction because we have to make sure not to fall into the Hegelian traps that were, you know, uh, all the cows are black at night. We want to maintain distinction. Um, there is damage in cyber. It's a different type of damage and we need to be mindful and, you know, regulate that type of damage, but it's not force. And I say this for two reasons. I think f philosophical thinking, but also because the type of damage and the type of things we can do in cyber gives us more affordances or more room than, for maneuvering than we have in kinetic. It might be, for example, ethically justifiable to be preventive in cyber as long as we can ensure that there are no kinetic effects. This is not allowed in, in, in kinetic world. If we do proper ethical thinking, we can understand these opportunities and trying to steer and, and leverage them. But we have to have a clear sense of what we're dealing with uh, and try not to erase the differences uh, as it were. So I hope that answers your question. Damage but not force. Thank you. Um, we can go to the lady in the blue jacket over here, please. We've got the mic. And then who else had the hand up? Yeah, come to guess next. And Thank you very much. I'm quite impressed. Um, you ended your talk referring to the post-digital societies. And it has never crossed my mind that we can speak about post-digital society because everything is digital nowadays. So I never thought about that. So how do you env envisage such a society and defense in such a society? Thank well, you. I think that, uh, I mean, it's a uh, post-digital societies will not stop being digital. It's just that we will stop talking about them being digital. We will be focusing on something else, perhaps by the time. I think we're going to have defenses very much like this. So, uh, you know, you, we have cyber and kinetic, and we will have, uh, well, technically we will talk about human-machine teaming, but decisions and operation will be run by teams, which includes human, humans and machines. 
uh, uh, and that would be that would be normal. Again, we know I'm not referring to any sci-fi scenario, but it would be normal that somebody will make the decisions to target X rather than Y in combination with a machine. Uh, it will be normal that intelligence is done in that way and so on and so forth. So uh, it's not post in the sense that we will forget about, we will not have digital. It's post in the sense that we will give digital for granted, very much like we give electricity these days. Uh, for granted. I'm not sure they had so many conferences on electricity. Or no, we don't talk about the electric revolution anymore no, or anything like that. So. <laughs> yes, that would be fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> All right, okay. Thank you. Um, gentleman, uh, Gus at the back in the black t shirt. Thank you. Black shirt. Hi, thanks for that great presentation. Um, going back to your example when you started with facial recognition. Uh, so my name is Gus, I work for Privacy International. And we took the case against the company Clearview in five jurisdictions. And in peace, in those five jurisdictions, that piece of technology was considered unlawful. In order to cleanse their reputation, Clearview then went to Ukraine and offered the technology for free there. And then it became a cause célèbre of like, oh, this is good technology because it's helping in a bad situation. So at what point does a technology go from unethical in the non-defense space to potentially ethical in this AI plus defense frame that you're talking about? Question, and, and uh, there are two aspects I want to raise with this one. Uh, it is very problematic to use this, as I mentioned, face recognition technology in civilian context. But it's true that in war, we have a it's not that we have different sets of principles, we have different thresholds, because we start from a situation where, as you were, everything has already gone wrong. If we are at war, we have already lost uh, several stages before, right? So uh, I, sometimes when I explain just what theory to my students, I, even, I say this is damage control theory, it's not really something else than that. But we have to be ready to the idea that something which is not acceptable in the civilian world might become useful in those contests, which does not mean that then it goes back and then it's a good thing. It's a good thing in that, for that purpose. But I think you touched also on another point. What we're learning in, in Ukraine is becoming a huge test bed for digital technologies in, in defense. You know? uh, and there are a lot of ethical questions which relate to the digital warfare, not just to AI, which we are not ready to address. For example, we are collecting a lot of data. Those are not personal data necessarily, but they are sensitive data. Who collects them? Uh, who has access to them? who's gonna use them and move for? How do you store them? If you're designing a cloud service for the Ministry of Defense in Ukraine, what are your ethical challenges? What is the procurement that you have between a government and a tech company in this context? These are ethical questions which need to be addressed. At the moment, we have known of that, uh, and that's why it's very problematic. Thank you. So I think uh, the gentleman here in the brown, jump in next, and then the gentleman in the front row. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, my name is Basil Jennings. I'm an engineer at Palantir. Um, one thing that I would really appreciate if, if you would expand on slightly, partly because I might have misunderstood, was the question of whether cyber operations um, sit within the military domain in this framework or outside the military domain in terms of the ethics framework. If I understood correctly, you took issue with the sort of Thomas Reid position that cyber operations should be characterized outside of the defense sphere as espionage or uh, intelligence gathering operations, more traditionally in this kind of information sphere. Um, and the shortcomings of that would be that you don't have the sort of necessity and proportionality framework that comes with just war calculations and this, this justice element um, that, that you think is missing. However, is the flip side of that not also true that if you fold these information or cyber operations into a defense context, you're sort of de facto declaring that all the major powers and many of the minor powers around the world are currently at war. Because you think they're not right now? Well, I, I, no, think, it's, I, think, it's <laughs> I, I think it's dangerous to make that elision without mm. a lot of critical context because you, you then, the knock-on effect of that would be, well, we're all at war anyway, what else does that justify in that case? Mm. So there are two, two points uh, to, to raise here. The first one is that the moment you have an office for offensive cyber as part of your defense establishment, we're not talking about espionage anymore. Uh, if NATO can do, can do offensive cyber, that's not espionage anymore, first. <laughs> Second is that not all conflicts are war, right? Uh, so it's not necessary that if you engage in a conflict officially, as we've done for kinetic conflicts for many, for decades, centuries, that doesn't mean that there is a war, there is a different scale. But if you 
flatten cyber with espionage and, uh, and sabotage, then you end up with this situation. Regulation is, would have been much more helpful and fine and easy to develop 12 years ago if we have not followed for the, for the logic. And let's be clear that the, the approach of the Talib manual was all designed and, and, and meant to create a free space for some state actors, which at the end, at the upper end, to be free to maneuver. But it's not paying well once other actors have acquired several skills, perhaps better than the ones we have, and they're countering now. So uh, I would be careful about binary and simplistic distinctions there. Thank you. Just get your microphone. Thank you. Hi. Jesus, I think I need four lives to digest all the things you touch upon. <laughs> um, just to cut a long story short, I'm going to focus just on the title of your presentation, Artificial Intelligence, and I, well, I'm usually fearful that is human stupidity and not artificial intelligence, as we know. Uh, ethics in the world of legally finding things, we talk about ethics, and in the world of intelligence, we do not. The, many times, the, the end justifies the means in intelligence. And sometimes it's interlinked defense and intelligence. And we may write about ethics, and then we spy on Merkel and the United Nations. And then we will write ethics, and we just come up with an explanation. But we do it anyway. Um, and more than making... Yes, yes, you're right. Um, but I, I don't mean to make statements. Uh, things that worry me is um, I see a floor well divided between uh, females and males, but when it comes to me doing operations, I lose the talent of women. I'm not a feminist or whatever, but there is raw talent that because of many reasons we are passing the bias we have as societies to this new cyber defense. And I'm glad to see you here and see you there, but you are the exception and not the norm. So I love the industry and I'm losing talent all the time because of all biases that we are passing on to artificial intelligence in a way. And I, I worry and I wonder if you have an answer to say, well, we could redress this. So far, the, the, the show is being run by market forces in artificial intelligence. They owe it to their shareholders. And I would want to see United Nations forcing some legislation that then can be adapted by different countries to force a, a common agreement with professionals, not just market forces, academics. I undertake research on this. I, I live on the dark web. That's my first home, and then my second home is the physical one. And I, I realize that I'm, I'm very lonely. <laughs> I'm very lonely. But I can make a uh, second advertising to the OI. We have the opposite problem. We have more female mm -hmm. students than, uh, than the male students. And that is so good. We, we're trying to, to help the world also from this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, we're coming to a close time. I've seen three other hands go up, so we might try and get to those. Um, so there's a gentleman, I think, at the back. Yeah, thank you. I'll be very quick. Three, three, um, thank you. So, hi, I'm James Sullivan. I'm the director of cyber here at the Institute. My question was on case studies. So, you talked about AI being involved in cyber operations. How many live case studies have you seen of the use of AI in cyber operations? And, and linked to that, um, how, how, how much do you think it's the responsibility of states? Because by nature, these things are secret. How much do you think it's the responsibility of states to share these case studies with wider society? Is that something they should do, or is it a, a frustration that they don't? OK, so uh, I'm going to say something really. I've seen some, but it's part of the project I'm working on. So but not, not many, admittedly. I don't think, and I, I, it's an important point to stretch this one, to stress. We don't have a capillary adoption of AI in defense. All the, I, I'm, the slides with the taxonomy mention possible uses. So it's something that we're doing, experimenting sometimes, but it's, it's going to happen. But I'm not claiming that it's like widely adopted these days. The second point is an interesting one because, again, transparency is not binary. 
you could be transparent, for example, as a state with closed business or, or secreted material, while sharing that information to an independent body, which could vet whether that's acceptable or not. So transparency does not mean that you publish it on the newspaper one day all the relevant information. So we, you can create ways where transparency is balanced with accountability without damaging national security whatsoever. So it's important we keep that in mind because these are quite often you know, uh, justification that we are like, well, we cannot share it for national security interest. Not with me, but at least with someone else independent, you might and you, and you want to. Thank you. Um, gentleman over here, thank you. And then last question I'll give to each other. Hi. My question is around the role of uh, private uh, enterprise tech companies, big tech and small tech. You mentioned experimental tech in Ukraine and other places. Is, um, is the role and influence of, of tech uh, something new? And is that a new dynamic between tech and states? Or is this just, uh, just the, the same thing with new, new powers and new technology? So I'll stay like this because otherwise I won't see you, Rick. Uh, uh, I think it's, it's not entirely new, but it's different uh, in the sense that the fence and tech sector, they've gone end in end, specifically in computing technologies since day zero. But I think the expertise that you find in the private companies these days, especially on the latest evolution, is something that the fence establishment needs to outsource to the private companies, they cannot do that in-house. And so that means that there is a stronger dependency or a stronger relation that the defense organization need to have uh, more than before. And this is not worryingly, but problematic in terms of the procurement that we have these days and whether that is sufficient to provide guarantees in terms of liabilities, for example. Um, because there will be a point where you want a liability for the AI systems doing mistake, and who's going to take the liability, for example, is the company, is the, the defense establishment. So there are new aspects to be considered there. Uh, it, it is a huge work, so we haven't even scratched the surface of it about getting there. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Can I just flag it? Is there any women who wanted to ask one last question? We're short on, the gender, on that gender <laughs> front, so stick up your hand. No, no. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Simon Albert from Adaga. Rosario, thank you very much for that synopsis. The, um, the, the bit I'm interested in is the, this sort of 15-year period, this almost genie out of the bottle. Uh, I was going to ask how you're feeling about it at the moment, but that's potentially a dangerous question. It's more a case of going, what do you see of the actions that need to be done going forward? Do you see it as a recoverable situation, or is the genie fully out? In terms of AI. Um, in terms of AI and ethics. And no, just give us a sense of what the actions are. I please. think we don't have years. We might have months uh, to, to, to intervene, which is a bit worryingly. Uh, I, I'm really frustrated by the fact the AI Act purposely uh, disregarded the use of AI in defense, creating this huge gap there. I can see the political reasons why that happened, but there, there are no justification to me. I think we, we have to make sure also that we do not instrumentalize ethics to fill a regulatory gap. Because ethics can support regulation making, can work on top of it, but cannot be a substitute for it. Because we, in democracies there has to be a, representat a representative dialogue and decision made in, the, in, the, in that way. Uh, it's important we start acting immediately. Uh, because we, we, this technology is already being used, and uh, I'm not sure we are happy with all the uses that we've been, uh, we have seen so far. Certainly are. Some have been uh, quite, uh, should I say, excruciatingly painful from an ethics point of view. Uh, yeah. It's not encouraging. <laughs> As I said, would any women like to ask one last question before we finish? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully you can hear me. I'm Louise Marie Urell. I'm a research fellow here at the Cyber Program. Um, just, just going back to James' question, I wonder whether you consider that there might be, <clears throat> in terms of accountability, right, and the application of AI in defense, whether there might be different logics of accountability competing with each other. So on the one hand, of course, when we think about the use of force, and force, as you said, like having kinetic effects, but on the other side, can countries be more accountable and transparent when they integrate AI into these kind of scenarios, right? Does that kind of make the equation blurrier in terms of the transparency element in the way in which they can explain why they're using and be more accountable for actually that integration of AI? Are we transposing existing challenges around, you know, transparency and AI into 
the defense context. So I, I'm just wondering whether there is, whether you consider there is a competing kind of types of logics around transparency and accountability when bringing those two worlds together. Okay, so accountability per se is not an issue because accountability can be ascribed de facto. Tomorrow morning we decide that every general is accountable for whatever AI systems is or air troops uh, uses and we sorted it. It's more a responsibility issue because more a responsibility which should underpin accountability needs to be ascribed in a fair and justifiable way. And for that to happen, there has to be a chain of intentionality. So the person who's held accountable has to have at some point some intention that make the system do A rather than B. This intentionality is broken by AI, not only because it's a learning system and is autonomous, but because most AI systems are not really predictable. So you can never say whether it did A or B because the human agent intended it or because we, they say, we, these days we will say with a bad word, it hallucinated. Uh, and so it's the moral, moral responsibility gap cannot be filled in this way. There, are alternative, there is alternative thinking. I've suggested some solutions somewhere else. I won't bore you with this uh, five minutes past five. But there might be some alternative thinking. But the problem is there, is the moral responsibility. Unfortunately, we have to finish this here. Um, I think there are so many more questions that, that I can see people thinking of in the, in the audience as they nod along or shake their heads. So I really hope you will come and join us upstairs now for a drink. You can, you can put Azari on the spot, ask her your questions, or just spend a moment looking around the most beautiful library upstairs. So come and join us for a drink in a moment. Um, but if I can just thank all of you, first of all, for coming along, for having your excellent questions. If I can thank Rusi, most importantly, for hosting us this afternoon. But if you could all help me thank Rosaria for her Great talk. I'd be very grateful. Hands together.